This week on CrossFeed. Is it legal to protest Scientology? Polygamy and persecution. Is that a dick in your pocket? Or are you just a seek? The science of lifelong love. And does absence training work or not? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. You'll notice that some of our stories, you heard part of that same introduction last week, if you're uh, listening to us every week, and uh, you also know that uh, we... Our last episode got chopped off because of a recording error, but the recording light is blinking, so I know that we're good to go. <laughs> and, uh, and and so what we wanted to do is there's a couple of stories that we already did them, you know, but you didn't get to see them, so we're doing them again. And um, so uh, because we've had a lot of fun, and it's it's going to be a little weird because we've already talked about them, but. So, you know, it's, it's, it's never quite as good the second time, but, uh, hopefully it won't be real noticeable. So we'll, we'll act shocked at each other's statements. This will be our second take. Uh, although I, my, my son out in Iraq says this is really lame that we're not doing an extra long show tonight because, you know, he got caught with a sh- shorter show last week and he wanted a longer show to make up for it. But, oh, well, such is life. Uh, but, uh, he just, uh, he just got in from his patrol and, uh, we were just talking, chatting online and he's getting ready to call it a night now. And, uh, actually he just went offline and, uh, he, one more month roughly and he'll be back in the States. Yeah. Cool. So we're glad of that. Um, so just a shout out there to Josh and also to my daughter Kelly down in Texas who will be graduating from her advanced training next Thursday night, so we may have to do next a week. We have to do that Sunday night because uh, I may be picking her up at the airport this time next week. I don't know. I haven't heard about when she's in. Well, you know, well, our, let's well, begin. Our, Go ahead. Our soldiers that are fighting for our rights and and protecting us to preserve our constitutional rights, such as, for instance, the right to protest. Uh, the First Amendment. Yep. Now, here we get into that interesting question on First Amendment of when does – when do uh, rights of um, – your right to protest and the right of property and other things uh, work together? And there's the guy who's protesting right there. Strange-looking dude, huh? <laughs> well, that picture got awfully choppy. I wonder why. Do um, the other ones seem to be okay. A lot of these guys are from uh, the group. Yeah, an- but that one's shopping. Uh, anonymous, and uh, and you know they're anonymous because they wear masks. Yeah, and the reason they do that is because they're trying to conceal their identities so that they don't get sued by the Scientologists. Right. Also, the the you know the, the caption under the picture from the article says Don Myers of West Hollywood. <laughs> so um, I think his identity's been blown. But anyway, so um, out in Riverside County, in California, there is uh, uh, the Church of uh, Scientology has pushed through. Well, together with some other people. Uh, um, their 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 main center for production dissemination of videos and tapes, uh, Golden Era Productions. And they get this big sprawling place, and they have 500 employees there. Plus, and some of the people live there, and some of the people then have been protesting there uh, around this particular thing. And the Scientologists say these people are dangerous. Is that where they film Battle, uh, Battlefield Earth? Speaking of dangerous, <laughs> man, if that didn't blow the Scientologist's reputation, I don't know what would. 
I, I, I never watch it. I, I've, I've sort of thought about it, but uh, uh, you know what? Then that's two hours of my life that I'll never get back. So I don't know if I really want to do that. I got better things to watch. Look at the bright side. Easter and John Travolta, and you know, you know, you know, financing the darn thing and spending all those months, uh, um, spending all those months uh, taping it. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, filming it, only to be, you know, laughed at so terribly. So, so. Okay, sorry. Anyway, um, so they have they wanted a ban on uh, on protesting and. So, because they, the campus received 56 bomb threats and 30 death threats in the last year, and one man was arrested recently for biting a security guard trying to move him away from the property. And um, so, uh, because of these incidents, uh, well, let's see, they asked uh, Supervisor Jeff Stone bought an ordinance to keep demonstrators away from living quarters on the property in un, in uh, in the town, and uh, so the supervisor put a, the measure on a fast track, meaning it did not get a second hearing, and so boom, that's it's done deal. Can't protest near the living within quarters. fifty. Well, well, actually, yeah, within fifty feet of the property. Problem is. It says that they own property on both sides of the street. Therefore, you can't even be out on the street. Yeah. And protest. Yeah. Uh, See, because, I, uh, I, don't get that. I don't get that. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, fifty feet from the property, and you know the the road's not a hundred feet wide. So, um, but I I've, I always thought that roads were public property, and therefore anybody could should be allowed to. Maybe you just need to like put some anti Scientology signs on your car and just sort of drive back and Keep forth down the road. Forward. And put some speakers on top of your car. Yeah, but the speakers would be drowned out. Because they put up uh they place large audio speakers alongside the road to play sound effects meant to drown out the shouts. Which I would think there'd be a noise ordinance, but what do I know? You know, well, the, who knows how many people are out there and stuff. I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, I don't like Scientology as not as a, a religion or particularly as an organization. Uh, they were known for lawsuits back in the late seventies and early eighties. Uh, I mean, including re- suing, re- suing that that radical uh, magazine Reader's Digest <laughs> for publishing some exposés on them. I mean, if they didn't, uh, they drove um, the Spiritual Counterfeits Project out of business by uh, suing them till they, you know, just kept throwing suits at them left and right till they just went bankrupt trying to pay lawyers. I mean, that's just what they were known for doing. So I don't like them as an organization. Um, however, and 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 I don't I don't think this group is was responsible for any death threats or for any bomb threats. Unfortunately, you get some wackos out there who are doing that, mm-hmm. and I think you know I can understand them saying, "Okay, I, I, I hate to say it, it's kind of the same thing at, at an abortion clinic. I don't like the free speech zones, you know, where where you know they have to stay so far away. These these buffer zones. On the other hand. Um, you know, people have bomb clinics. I mean, you know, every reputable pro-life organization has a no, don't do that. That we 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 find that detestable, but the nutcases have still done it. And the same thing here. You probably have some good, reputable, upstanding people, and the nutcases are making things more difficult. Yep. All right. You know, the Scientologists, as much as I disagree with just about everything that they stand for, um, and every one of their practices, um, and I think that of, of the inherent, the adherents that I know, you know, um, all the, the Hollywood people, um, I think they're not jobs. But at the same time, they do have a right to assemble and, you know, and feel safe and all that kind of stuff. 
they've got to make sure that there's a way that people can still protest them, though. Um, they did say that they were going to revisit the um, the bill if it, if within six months, if need be. Um, but we're in trouble. You've got there was a group that that showed up to protest um, after the ordinance went through, and four oh. four Riverside County Sheriff's oh. cruisers pulled up, and we are recording. Oh. <laughs> the okay, light is yeah, flashing. I just had another glitch, and so I'm just making sure Dale had it. No, you know, I, on the other hand, though, Dale, I can't, I can't understand them being worried. You know, I mean, look at this guy. What is this, Super Pope or something, you know? He's got this, you know, it's like a bishop's mitre and the mask on, you know? It just, like, you know, I had all these little cape on behind him, you know? And <laughs> Maybe he's the Spanish Inquisition. I mean, people wouldn't expect that. That's true. But the other thing is, you know, some of these, one of the signs is, you know, tax the cultists. You know, the problem is, is that unfortunately... It is, uh, you know, a legally legally a church, and so you can't tax it, even though it's kind of a nut group. Nut group. Uh, and we didn't they lose their tax exempt status in like Germany or Netherlands or something like that? Yes, they did. Yep. Yeah, I believe they lost it overseas. You know, and uh, now, uh, but that is life. Oh, let's get off these people. I'll tell you, they drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, well, I can't I talk about it. Well, as long as we're talking about weird people, let's talk about uh, Winston Blackmore and his um, polygamous. Okay. okay. Where is it? Okay, now you got a better picture there. Well, I don't know. You know, that's a bad picture, but I'm not sure that one's a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to know is why does somebody look like that wind up with 20 wives? Well, he's a religious leader. I mean, but... I'm going to marry that man. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he, he's a way past middle-aged, homely-looking <laughs> homely looking dude, you know? <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he's like practically Jesus, you know? I don't know what he is. Anyway, he... Um, uh, anyhow, this guy's Winston Blackmore is his name, and he is uh, there, uh, the leader of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints up in uh, Canada. And uh, he is now complaining that the authorities are engaging in religious persecution by charging him with polygamy. Uh, both he, and he's 52, and his uh, partner, who's 44, um, James Oler. Oh, oh, no, no, no. He, uh, um, no, I guess it's his rival, because they yeah. did rival polygamous yeah. factions. Uh, but he he has, I think, 20 wives. Are you totally deranged? He's a busy guy. Do they make that much Viagra? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's 52, yeah, so... I don't know, but... <clears throat> That's, uh, he's complaining that he's saying, look, this is religious persecution. There are uh, tens of thousands of polygamists across Canada, but he's being singled out uh, and disregarding his right to religious freedom. All right. If there are that many, I am guessing that the authorities don't know about it because I know here in the States, at least, I hear about plenty of of uh, polygamists who get arrested for polygamy that are not Mormon or any offshoot of Mormonism. All right. So important to clarify, regular mainstream Mormons um, renounced polygamy in 1890 as a condition of Utah's statehood. Um, it was one of those deals where in Mormonism, God can change his mind. And in this case, he did. So, uh, so interestingly, Very conveniently. yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, back before that, uh, they were pushing for a law to define marriage as between one man and one woman. 
and the Mormons were, or Joseph Smith was completely against it and said, oh, this is horrible and stuff. And now what are the Mormons pushing for? Speaking of um, protesting churches, <laughs> they're pushing for marriage to be defined as between one man and one woman. <laughs> because that's the way God wants it, you know. <laughs> So, but these are the fundamentalist Mormons who um, don't change their, or at least their God doesn't change his mind as often. Um, and, uh, and, and their God still says that uh, the polygamy is the right thing to do. Um, you know, this gets back to that question that we keep hitting again and again. How do you define marriage? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and it's, you know, the same sex marriage is legal in Canada. So, I mean, you know, if you've got a group of consenting adults, how can you say, no, this is wrong in this case? Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Although, now that's the question. Is it consenting adults? Um, you and I got a comment there on a, on this story um, online, and uh guy, ca- guy called himself obstructionist. Um, but, uh, you know, he says... Um, uh, you know, will this be solely about polygamy, or will we see Winston explain how he took Lorraine Johnson at age 15? Hmm. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a question. I mean, and that's the thing going on with with a lot of these fundamentalist groups is that these aren't, you know, 19, 20 year olds. A lot of them are underage kids who are being married to these guys. Mm-hmm. And so that's. Uh, uh, a real problem. I mean, obviously, it's a huge problem. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, <clears throat> I don't see how the Can- Canadian courts can really rule against them. Yeah, you wonder how a guy like that can get all those wives? Hey, arranged marriage, she didn't have a choice in the matter. Probably it. Okay, but what about marriages that are good marriages? You know, can they last forever? Well, uh, according to a recent study, yes, among 10% of people. <laughs> so so given that the divorce rate is 50%, roughly, uh, I don't know, it's growing, so maybe I think it's up to about 60 now. But um, I actually heard um, it's declining. Oh, is it now? Good. I know it was growing for a while. But anyway, um, that means that that like 40% or whatever... That's just a fluke. (laughs) Well, what it is is uh, using brain scans. Uh, They said that there are couples uh, who've been married as long as 20 years um, have as much passion as those who, you know, are the early throws of romance. Um, And they 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 measured this by the the chemicals that are in the brain, you know, and, and figure out, you know, what chemicals are there. And that's how we're going to define how and love someone is. Now, as you pointed last week, the problem is this, is it's defining love as infatuation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's that whole, is love a feeling? You know, is it love something you feel or is it something you do? Now, I am blessed to be in that 10% that my brain chemistry works when I think about my wife um, and, and spend time with her. It's, it, you know, it's it's very much like when we first started out. I still get those kind of, um, you know, my heart skips a beat and, and all that kind of stuff, right? But, uh, you know, even if I didn't have those feelings, and I'm sure that there's people out there that don't have those feelings, um, because love change or your, you know, your feelings change over time. That's the nature of feelings. Um, that's okay. Because love is not a feeling. Love is something you do. Love is sacrifice. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, I don't know. You want to know what love is? You uh, look at Jesus on the cross. All right, that's love. All right, that that's not. Oh, you know, that's you know, God, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You know. As the great Lutheran preacher H. Grady Davis once said, there is no such thing as love. There are only lovers. And it's... Okay, number one, we change as we get older. I mean, it's the one thing about being 48 now, and um, 
you know, you know, two years from my first issue of Modern Maturity is, um, you know, seeing my kids now in their 20s. You know, it's kind of weird to think that, talking to my wife yesterday, it's weird to think that, you know, we're roughly at the age that uh, her parents were when we started dating. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting that, that generational turnover here. And we're, you know, now it's watching our kids there in, in their 20s and young and, you know, and, and in love and all that kind of cool stuff. You know, it's kind of fun to watch. But we're, you know, the, 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 the relationship is different because we're older, you know. But, um, you know, we've got 26 years together. So this, this is a, you know, a fine, like, like, like I said, a finely matured wine. Now, maybe the excitement, the passion's not there, but, uh, you know, frankly, I'm too tired for excitement and passion at this <laughs> stage of my life. <laughs> there may be a little dust on the bottle. You you know, I, uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, I mean, you, you just, I'm just more mellow than I used to be when I was in my 20s, you know, I really am. I just, it's life. Um, so, so you can't help but change, and, and your and your feelings for they don't change, but they deepen. And you realize it's not this this flighty stuff so much as it is this commitment that's there and is there daily, and it doesn't change. You see, that's really what you know. Talking about Jesus on the cross, really, what love is is a commitment, because it is very possible to feel in love with someone. I had a couple one time. I'm never this guy one time. And he wanted to get divorced because he'd seen this old girlfriend and his feelings were just overtaken. And he said, I, 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 if I feel this way, I should divorce my wife because I feel this way. I'm like, no, you've made a commitment. You stick with the commitment. The feelings will go away. Right. Yeah. You know, this is the... <clears throat> This is the question of, uh, you know, is there such thing as a match made in heaven? You know, is there, uh, um, you know, is there one person out there uh, that God has intended for you? And, you know, people get that idea and, and then, you know, somebody else comes along after they're already married and they go, oh, I married the wrong person. I should have married this other person. This is the person God wanted me to be with. So they get a divorce and they go marry that person. And then somebody else comes along and goes, oh, Oh wait, no, I was wrong. It's the, and, you know, and they go through a series of divorces. And here's the thing: I could have had a V eight. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality is that there are any number of people in the world that you could have a happy marriage with. You know, that you could be very content mm -hmm. with and and really enjoy spending your life with. Okay, but once you're married then that's it. That's the person that God intends for you as the person that you married. And, uh, and, and once you're married, that's it, you know, now that person, um, passes away, then there may be somebody out there. Maybe, maybe not, you know, um, that, you know, that, that you find, but it's when you're married to somebody, that's the person for you. You know, at that point, you can say this is a match made in heaven, right? But not until then. I mean, and it's perfectly possible, I think. And I remember reading Ann Landers about this. It's perfectly possible that when you're married, you fall in love with someone else. I mean, it's that's that's or frozen again. Really? As I was saying before, we so rudely interrupted. You know, this is going to be fun for Dale to edit tonight. He's, going to, he's got like five different things he's got to manage to put together. So he's not going to see sleep till dawn. I have anyway, off so, tomorrow. I'm going to spend tomorrow. the day playing video games with my kids because they're going to be off school because it's so darn cold over here. Cool. I woke but, up this uh, morning. It was minus 22 outside without hey. the wind chill. See, we were complaining because it was almost zero here. We haven't seen zero. <laughs> okay, anyway, back to love. Something back warm. warm. Yeah. Mm. I'm not even going there. I didn't say hot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. You're saying the one. You're the one sitting there saying the passion's just as strong. So I don't know. I, I wasn't. Uh... I was sitting over here going, hmm, I'm not commenting on this. No, I'm not. I'm keep my mouth shut. 
Anyway, um, no, I think it's very possible to be married to somebody and then turn around and, quote, fall in love with someone else, to have these emotions and things. But you just sit back and realize, but I'm committed to this person. This is where my commitment lies. If those feelings work for other people, they'll go away. You know, they think, you know, because that's the nature of feelings. They change. And, uh, you know, that, and so I really have this thing of, oh, yeah, we know these people are, you know, just as passionate as ever because we know the brain scans. And the passion still, it's just a different kind of passion. Here's there was some movie. Was movie. Trying to remember. Um, it was, there was this couple, they were planning on getting divorced. And, uh, and they, they sent their kids off to summer camp. And, um, and then they were gonna, they were gonna kind of work it out over the summer while the kids are at camp and, and they couldn't work it out and stuff. And then they're, they're, they're picking up the kids from camp and, and all of a sudden the, I think it was the wife that was pushing for the divorce. If somebody knows what movie I'm talking about, send us a note, podcast at crossfeednews.com. So I'm trying to remember. I, I really liked how it ended because I wasn't liking it. I don't like divorce movies. Um, but this, at the end, she goes, uh, the, the wife, she sort of flashes back to all this stuff throughout their marriage, all these events and stuff. And she goes, you know what? I don't want a divorce because we have a history together. Whatever problems that we have, we have this history, you know, and we've got this, all of this stuff that we've gone through together. And it just seems so pointless to just throw it, all of that away. And uh, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, even that I don't think is a good enough reason. I think it really needs to be all about just because I'm committed to you, period, end of discussion. Mm-hmm. Right. But, um, you know, and, and and quite honestly, that is one of the big reasons that I married my wife. All right. I come from a long line of divorces. All right. My parents are divorced. My grandparents are divorced. My great grandparents are divorced. All right. But. And so I was determined, I, the woman that I marry is going to be somebody that does not believe in divorce. All right. And so we had made it, I mean, had an understanding before we, you know, before we ever came close to getting married was that if we get married, you know, that's it. We, if, even if we end up hating each other, we're going to stay together and we're going to have to work it out or we're just going to be miserable for the rest of our lives, you know, and And it wasn't like, you know, that I said, look, here's the deal, you know, but I knew that she had that same understanding. And, uh, you know, thankfully we have a great marriage and, you know, I, um, well, like every marriage we have ups and downs and all that, but, you know, overall we have a really great marriage and just absolutely thrilled to be married to my wife. And so, um, you know, it hasn't really been an issue, you know, but when we have those downs, we work them out. You know, and, um, uh, and what it comes down to is that, um, you know, in our case, it's a little easier cause we want to be together, you know? And so we want to work those things out, but, um, but even if you don't want to, um, that's the way it is and work it out and, um, you know, trust God that you will be happier. This, you know, this, when we look at marriage, it, we need to understand it in the Ephesians five context, right? That marriage is a model of our relationship with God. All right. When, you know, God should have divorced us a long time ago. You know, read the book of Hosea, you know, how unfaithful we've been to God. And, uh, and so we don't deserve to have God as our, um, bridegroom as, is the, um, term that's generally used. Um, but he's still faithful to us. You look at our relationship with God and, um, while God does not, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know how God feels about us. All right. I don't know what God's emotions are like. All right. But you know what? He's committed to us and he says, I'm going to stick by you no matter what, even if I have to die for you, even if, even if I have to be tortured for you, no matter what, you know, when we say for better or for worse, we mean it. And it's because of it's, it's that 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 love that he shows to us when we especially as christians right when we have a marriage that through thick and thin and and through for really for better or for worse um we're going to stick by each other what are we doing we're showing the world this is the love that god has 
that no matter what, he's going to stick by us. Right? And it's a whole lot easier to say, yes, there is such a thing as unconditional love. Uh, there is such a thing as love that goes beyond any of our uh, shortcomings. If we have something that we can demonstrate, that we can say, look, you know, we live out that love in our marriage. So it makes a difference. And you notice the guy who talks, you know, he's saying, you know, that they love each other and they've got this great relationship. He is. I haven't heard anything from Teresa here. <laughs> so she may have a different side of this. I mean, after all, she's stuck with Dale. My wife is a very forgiving woman. Yeah. And she's a very committed woman. She married me, and some people say that she should be committed for doing that, but she's a very loving, wonderful woman. Speaking of young love, there was a study done recently. It's going to be published in the journal, or it may have been published by now, by the parent journal Pediatrics uh, <coughs> by Janet Rosenbaum, doctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins. And it's an interesting... now. You might have read about this. It deals with the abstinence pledges. And a lot of this, this, this came out and there's all of a sudden there's all these um, headlines that abstinent pledges don't work. Yada, yada, yada. Okay. <coughs> the problem is, it needs to be understood in reading this, in reading this, um, what she dealt with was two... I seem to have a thing for sinners. Only religious uh, kids. Groups here, two religious groups, religious kids who took pledges and religious kids who did not pledge. But they were only religious kids. Yeah, not a random fact, sample. She said, no, not a random sample. Matter of fact, she said she did not, she purposely excluded non-religious kids. Because why would she want to, you know, compare them to kids, you know, that they're, they're not apt to be, you know, make such a pledge or say this is important anyway. So it wasn't. Um, uh, so when, when, you, if you read about this, uh, all those headlines that said it didn't make a difference, those were all wrong because she's only dealing with religious kids from religious families. Now, having said that, um, she said, um, you know, kids who are choosing to be really religious overall are also choosing to abstain. Mm -hmm. Um, now, what they said was, is, um, you know, they had some sexual activity about five years or so after they had taken um, uh, these virginity pledges. <laughs> Interesting enough, 80% of those who had taken virginity pledges forgot they ever did so. It's <laughs> convenient. But on the other hand, they are... Um, you know, their, their, their first sexual experience was more at age 21... As opposed to 17 or 18. So it, there is some positive news here. And you think, I mean, at age 20 or 21, you're not talking about children anymore. Like you are, you know, 15, 16. You're talking young adults. Yep. I'm talking off to college and mom and dad aren't there and, and stuff like that. But, you know, right, this, but, this you part know, about the, the, those who were, oh, the other group that she excluded, was those who again but note that the religious kids were the ones that were delaying when you look at when you compare religious kids to not religious kids the religious kids tend to delay mm -hmm. there is actually a measurable difference there that mm -hmm. religious beliefs cause them to on average delay All right the other group that they did not include was uh, married. Because, well, okay, that doesn't count, right? Okay, well, how many of them got married, though? And, uh, you know, they delayed until they got married. And that would be, that was a part of this, or, you know, that wasn't a part of the study, but that would have been a very interesting part of the study, you know, if, if they had mm -hmm. checked that, you know, how many, just how many of them are taken out of the study to be counted uh, because they got married and instead of, right. you know, waiting uh, to get married. 
I was 21 and my wife was 20 when we got married. I think among evangelical, you know, evangelical and strong Christian kids, that may not be that uncommon to get married at younger ages. Uh, although than the average, I mean, in Massachusetts right now, the average is 27. I mean, it's way up there. Uh, may, you know, so that may be, that may impact it as well. Now, the other part of the study that, that, that interesting enough comes up with is, says that, uh, they, they were more in, likely to engage in unprotected sex. The ones that had taken the pledges. Yeah, the ones that had taken the pledge. And we, as we, we noted last week, uh, what I thought was a very, you know, uh, key point is, because I think the majority of the time, the kids know what they're doing is wrong. Or these young adults. They, they know that this behavior is sinful. They don't want to plan for it. They don't want to think, okay, uh, we're going to plan to uh, 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 have sex this weekend. So we need to plan ahead for this. Because they know in their hearts that this, this is not what God wants. Yeah. So, and so not going to do it, but then, it, you know, they find watch your guard very down. Difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, interestingly, then, you know, sexual sin is the one sin in the Bible. I've probably mentioned this before on the show. Sexual sin is the one sin in the Bible that God tells us or does not tell us to take a stand against. He says to flee from it because he knows that it's it's one thing to stand up against you know murder and you know all kinds of stuff like that all right but boy when it comes to standing up against sexual temptation it just just get out of there all right because they really that's you know that's the only safe method is uh you know flee hey, and you know this from personal experience well, I didn't used to be married. And <laughs> <laughs> my son and Rax listening to this going, oh, my God. <laughs> so anyway, but, you know, it, it, I thought it was an interesting, you know, part there. But I think it is. I think the kids, you know, they know, they realize this is wrong. They realize they, they know what God wants and what God doesn't want. And they really struggle with that. And, and they're trying to sit back and, and, and be, you know, do what God wants. And yet at the same time, they're finding, uh, it's not always as easy as it would like, to, as we would like to make it. Um, and yes, I think, you know, you're right. It's, it's absolutely flee, run from it, get out of there. But how hard it is to flee? How hard is it to say, uh, no, that I, we need to, you know, do something? I, you know, because then once you you fall into a, a sexual sin, you know, it's not like you can go back to holding hands. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a very, very difficult thing. Hey, somebody get some pants on that kid! That I don't know from experience. <laughs> that you don't know from experience. Okay. Well, I know the fleeing from matter, part. But... <laughs> okay, we froze again. And froze again. I have no idea what it was I was saying before we were so rudely cut off, so we're just going to hold it right there and move on. But, uh, you know, uh, the other thing, though, to anybody who's finding themselves caught up and in, in caught up, remember God's forgiveness and grace. Mm-hmm. His grace is always there. And um, we always want to remind people of that, that forgiveness. Uh, Jesus died for all sin. Uh, we end on a kind of a weird story tonight. Uh, but again, you know, it goes back maybe to the very first phone, talk about Scientology and religious freedom, and here we're kind of dealing back with the like, issue of religious freedom here. Um, woman's name is, what is her name again? It's, um, and I'm probably slaughtering this, uh, Kawajit Kaur Tagore. Cool. What a name. Anyway, <laughs> she works for the IRS in uh, is it Dallas, Texas, is where she works. Yep. I believe so. Can't remember. Uh, but she um, started working there in 2007, and then became, and not shortly after that, became a Sikh. Now, one of the parts of being a Sikh is there's five articles that you must wear, and one of them happens to be that little knife that you see right there in her hip. And um, now the IRS says you cannot um, have any kind of knives at work. So now we've got a problem here. Well, what do we do? And uh, she had a 
Originally, it was a six-inch long sheet. Six-inch blade, uh, not, total of nine six inches. Blade. Yeah, total nine inches. And then she shrank it down to uh, a to this one here, which is uh, six inches long with a three-inch blade. But the interesting thing is there's nothing in the Sikh religion that says how long that blade has to be. It's totally up to the person. Yeah, I mean, she, she could probably just get a little one and, you know, wear it as a necklace or something. But Right. Uh, right uh, but she says that for her, that length is the right length because it's up to the person. And she says for her, this is the length. And she says it's dull. You can't cut with it. You can't do anything with it. So it really can't be a – it's really not a weapon. It stays – you know, in yeah, its sheath. You wear its sheath. It's, it's purely sheath. symbolic. It doesn't even set off the metal detectors in the building. And right. she said, yeah. hey, hey. "Go ahead." They also have. She says, even though the government allows hundreds of sharp scissors, letter openers, knives, and box cutters in the building, uh, oh, it's in Houston. Um, okay. So, but she's not allowed to have this blunt thing that you really couldn't even use as a weapon if you wanted to. Okay, part of me sits back and says, I understand no knives. I, 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 I totally get that. But I think, I think she's got a point. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you're going to allow, you know, things that are sharp in the building. Right. Then, okay, this is a dull knife. On the other hand, on the other hand, they said if it was a two and a half inch blade, if it was a half an inch shorter, they wouldn't say anything about it to her about it. Yeah, and that's kind of, but at the same time, I don't think it's the government's job to dictate how a person practices their religion. The, you know, the fact is, this is a particular element, and for different people, you know, they feel that the different lengths matter. And, you know, I think what it comes down to is, can you really, because it's blunt, can you really even define it as a blade? I mean, you know, if you look at it, 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 well, you can't really see it because it's sheathed, which is the point. You know, it's it's symbolic. It's called a kirpan or a kirpan, um, and it's intended to remind the bearer of a Sikh's duty to protect the weak and promote justice. Okay, so it's purely symbolic, and um, the fact that the thing is, when she went, you know, I, I kind of thought, well, gee, if there's somebody walking around the office wearing a knife strap to their belt, you know, I might be a little nervous. Okay, but. When she became a Sikh and she was initiated into it and became a, you know, full Sikh or whatever, um, she went, she was wearing it under her shirt, so it wasn't, you know, like she was brandishing it, okay? And she went to her supervisor and basically said, just so you know, I've got this thing. It's not a real weapon or anything. It's just, it's part of my religion. And I just want you to know so that if someone happens to see it or something, you know, that you understand that this isn't, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to sneak weapons into the building or anything. Okay. And her supervisor got all upset. All right. Now I can see like sending out a memo. Okay. And I'm sure that she would agree with to this. All right, we're just going to send out a memo to, to everybody in the office to let them know that if they happen to see you, you know, wearing this thing, this is what it is. It's nothing to worry about, you know, or anything like that. Okay. I, you know, I would think that would be fine. And I don't think she would have a problem with that because it, it lets people know who she is and what she's about. All right. And, um, but, but they said, no, you, you can't, can't have it at all. And see, you know, I'm looking at it going, she made the effort of communicating, of letting people know what was going on. If, you know, she went to her supervisor. It's not like she got caught with it, you know? I mean, she took the initiative to make sure that the communication lines were open and all that kind of stuff. So, I, you know, the fact, if, if this were a sharpened blade, then, yeah, then I might have a problem with it, okay? But this is a blunt... You know, this is this is a blunt. And it's not even metal, apparently, because it doesn't set off the metal detectors, or it's some kind of other kind of metal or something. But you know, this isn't a weapon, so it's it's purely you know anybody else would just look at it and say it's it's decorative. It's it's like a fancy belt buckle, except it's worn on the side instead of the front. You know, I I don't know. I I think she should be allowed to wear it. 
which points out that the International Monetary Fund and AT&T and other companies are allowing it. Um, it's interesting reading the comments. I mean, most of them were like, you know, here's the rules, lady, done. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think we need to be, again, religiously tolerant where we can. So I think she's a very chic Sikh, and we should just, you know, push it going. <laughs> I don't want to use that line, for, you know, <laughs> the whole time you're talking. <laughs> but maybe you guys have another opinion. Uh, you can always write to us at uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com, or as our one buddy did, you can put comments up on the comment section of uh, the individual stories, as the one guy did about the um, polygamous case, uh, our buddy obstructionist there, and we, we, we thanked him. Um we got a couple of interesting comments. One on break.com this week. Um, I don't have the actual comment in front of me. I, I have it here. You, yeah. you have it. Okay, okay. go for it. This, this, is from our, who liked our, this is from our Christmas episode. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, it says, if you think God doesn't mind... A, okay, we were talking about uh, Christmas trees and how that's not... It's sort of a lot of pagan stuff has been adopted into Christianity. Christmas trees were originally not Christian, but we've sort of taken them and Christianized them. Okay. So he says, if you think God doesn't mind a Christmas tree, go ahead and read the KJV, the King James Bible. Um, well, right there we have a problem because, um, I read the original Hebrew. (laughs) So, um, anyway, uh, Jeremiah 10, also find out what the uh, biblical definition of idol is. So-called Christians, so already calling us not Christians, um, idolize the Christmas tree every tree season. Uh, they take pictures of it, bow and sit before it to open gifts, and talk about how long it took to decorate it for five-plus minutes on the Internet. Did we talk about how long we had to decorate it for that long? Uh, we might have. Okay. I wasn't timing that part of it. So as pastors, in quotes, you will be held to a higher standard come that day. You better make sure you know what you're talking about and telling others. First of all, absolutely, you're correct. At the end of that, we are held to a higher standard. Therefore, we must indeed be careful what we uh, tell others. That is, uh, we, Dale and I would agree with that 100%. Um, that's why we're both evangelical Lutherans, because we want to teach the, the whole truth, the pure truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, so, uh, which we both believe is the uh, evangelical Lutheran faith. So, uh, which is the true Catholic faith. That was Little C. Driving bunkers on. <laughs> so, so uh, the, and within that uh, uh, Christian faith, there is freedom. Uh, idols are not a matter necessarily of little statues. Really, idols are a matter of the heart. Uh, Luther defines the first commandment by saying we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Whatever we fear, love, or trust more than God, that is an idol. Uh, Luther says whatever you turn to in times of need, that is your God. Yep. And yep. Um, so the... Um, uh, 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 and the greatest God of all, of course, is really ourselves, because we always want to tell God, take a flying leap, I'm going to do what I want. So uh, that's how I think think the whole issue comes down to. I'm going to get rid of our chic seek there behind me. Sorry. Dale used to be so good at these backgrounds. I mean, he used to push those buttons, you know, and get those new, new things up there all the time, but I, I forget them. Anyhow, uh, I forget to change yeah, them. We're going to have to cut Jim's pay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can't cut any lower. I'll be paying you. Uh, anyways, <laughs> and you'll be paying people to watch the show. But uh, so uh, you know. But uh, back, back to this. Um, so because of that, you know, the, the Christmas trees are not idols. Some people can make Christmas into an idol. Some people can make the gift giving into an idol. But that's really an attitude of their heart. But Christmas trees. Our trees. I don't trust my tree for anything. I get frustrated with it sometimes. You know, the whole rigging up the lights, you know, that part of it. Um, but, uh, and, and I, you know, I've, I, I know that in that episode at the beginning, I, I remember this now that I'm thinking about it, I did show a picture of our tree because I thought it was mm-hmm. really pretty. Okay. Um, and, uh, I, I've shown pictures of our church uh, in the wintertime because it looks really pretty in the wintertime with the ice on the trees and stuff like that. Um, 
but I don't worship the building either. You know, um, I have, I have crosses, uh, made of wood, just like a Christmas tree, you know? I mean, that's what he's, he's talking about this passage in Jeremiah 10 that talks about a guy that, um, that brings, a um, a, a tree into his house and, and worships it. What he's talking about is it taking a tree and carving it into an idol. All right. I have trees that are carved into crosses and, uh, I've got this really cool thing that my, mm. uh, parents got me for Christmas a couple years ago. Um, of all seasons and uh it's uh it's the name of jesus with a nail in the background and it's carved out of wood and it's really cool it's hanging up in my office um got a comment on it this morning actually um but uh you know that doesn't mean i worship those things those are you know even the christmas tree for me is an expression of my faith in the one who died on the tree you know Mm -hmm. to take away my sins and and the you know the for me a Christmas tree is, uh, you know, the evergreen tree and especially ours, which is artificial and uh, plastic. And so it's really a good symbol of eternal life. <laughs> Although even it doesn't, you know, last forever because there's still needles on the ground every year when we take it down. <laughs> so thank you for the comment, even if we disagree, but I sure do. We sure do appreciate your comment. Mm-hmm. Um, any other comments to share this week? There's a, there are a whole bunch of comments on different stories on our site. Um, can't really get into all of them. Um, but I, I did, I noticed there was, uh, um, all right. Our crossfeednews.com is set up to, um, because of all the spam that we get, our, our spam catchers catch most of it, um, but not all of it. And so I've got it set up so that if you do not have an account, um, your comments have to get approved and I don't get a notification or anything like that. Uh, when someone posts a a message that goes into the approval queue. Now I've added to my list of sites that I visit every morning, the approval queue. And so I'll start checking it four days a week, uh, Monday through Thursday, uh, when I get into the office and, you know, fire up my list of, of sites that I go to first thing in the morning. And, uh, so, you know, if you post a comment, the easier thing to do though, is just create an account. It's free. Um, you know, and, and all of your personal, we don't get your personal information or anything. It's, it's, uh, it's all encrypted into the system. So I couldn't even, you know, don't write me asking for your password because I don't know it and I can't get it for you. All I could do is reset it for you. Okay. Um, but the point is, is that you, what you can do is go and create an account. Not only will that allow you to post comments without having to go through the approval queue, uh, it will also allow you to post stories. So that when you find an interesting story, uh, you can post it on the site. And that's kind of the point of the site. And, um, or if you, uh, for that matter, if, if there's something really, you know, newsworthy that's happening around you, um, write the story up, post it there, you know, be a correspondent for the site and, um, and, and let us know what interesting stuff is going on there. And because we do, we, you know, we'd love to see stories that are posted besides just from Jim and me. And, um, and, and so, and a lot of times if, if it's uh, something that, you know, that we could really talk about on the show, we'd like to talk about those kind of stories. Um, just because we know that this stuff really is of interest to, um, to our, our viewers and listeners. So definitely let, you know, let us know, post mm-hmm. the stories up that are interesting to you. And we hope you have a good good weekend. Uh, please uh, try to warm up. And um, Dale, you keep warm tonight. Yeah. Yep. So. Good night, everybody. God bless. Good night, everybody. God bless. Bye bye.